Welcome back to another Box Score Geek show. I'm your host, Dre Alvarez, known most places as Nerd Numbers, and we are running down the end of the NBA season with my team, your team, Brian. We are Denver Nuggets fans, Warriors fans on this podcast, so we should have tons to discuss. And uh, Brian, on the script, I, I don't know what's going on here. I have a reality TV show, Babylon 5, but don't worry. We also have lots of sports t- sports talk that I know you're all here for. Uh, I'm going to be a little quicker on the commercial this time just because I realize this is an amateur mistake, Brian. I did not get any copy up in front of me, and I don't want to wing it too much. Anyway, here's the gist. Box Score Geek Show is sponsored by sunshower.io. They're really helpful if you're looking for cloud-based solutions. They have offer a combination of services, including getting you set up if you already have a cloud-based solution. They look at ways to optimize, tell you if you can save money by you know, transferring and then additionally helping you transfer. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, if you're a hobbyist, if you're a big company that has you know a billion different Amazon uh, warehouses running for you, uh, Amazon AWS, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it, it's nuts. I, I would not have pictured that a bookstore, Brian, would become the biggest provider of servers in the world. And in fact, on this tangent, unrelated to any copy, as I already mentioned, there was no copy, but I know Brian, you and I have in the tech field experienced these fun days. There are days where like the internet goes down and it, and it is literally like three data clusters of Amazon servers went down that run everything. Oh, yeah. it, it's nuts. So if you're one of the people that makes stuff like that and you want to make sure your your servers are as optimal as can be, as affordable as can be, go to sunshower.io, use the offer code nerdnumbers, forward slash nerdnumbers. I don't know what they offer at, at this point. I think they're still relatively new, so a lot of their stuff they're offering free. But if you tell them I sent you, they'll, they'll like us. So anyway, that's what we got, Brian. We have a, a ton of stuff to go around, so just the, the general synopsis of the show. We do last week on Lost. That's comments you've made on things we've posted in the last week. Around the NBA, a, a cacophony of subjects you and I have dug through and decided we want to talk about. And a few major subjects this week, Brian, we actually got up to three, so we'll try and do them quick. Some TV talk. I've been following Mental Samurai, and I want to talk Babylon 5, because you know what, Brian? It's my show, and uh, you want to talk Game of Thrones, so this show's going to go three hours. Good times. Oh, we're going to talk some March Madness. That's going on. Coach Krasinski has some talks, and then I, I have a, a common uh, hypothetical that comes up that I want to talk about. And then right before this show, Brian, I think you you watched, I think it came out earlier in the week, but John Oliver released. I did get to watch it, yeah. Released a fantastic segment on the WWE and WrestleMania is around the corner, so we definitely got to talk that. All right, let, let's hop into the comments. So this was an interesting one, Brian, and we, we revisited a lot, but I at least just want to make sure for the billionth time my, my point is crystallized and I can actually even potentially use it to get off on a soapbox. So we, we were kind of talking the the Steph Curry versus Kevin Durant argument last week, and, and you usually chime in on this a lot where, you know, the reason Golden State Warriors fans teamed to like Curry more is, you know, he was a homegrown guy. He he was loyal from the get-go and blah, 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 whereas Kevin Durant's just a mercenary who couldn't even beat the Warriors in the playoffs and, you know, just had to join a winner. <coughs> Which is yeah, a and this is a comment that I made on the comment section myself, so there you go. <laughs> All right, so but, but why don't you read your comment, and I'll see if I have to cough out again, um, but then, then we can keep going. So, yeah, what was your comment? No, I mean, you pretty much covered it. Um, there is some on-the-court style things about Curry that fans like. Um, there's So the, the idea that Curry changed the game in the NBA in two different ways, one being taking all these three-point shooters, and the way he does it also, taking the long ones, you know, running, doing these Spurs-type cuts where he runs all over the place, you know, that kind of stuff. They like that. The other side of it is um, deferring his ego to bring in other superstars. That's another thing they like about him. So, and he's also signed for the long term. That's the big thing, right? Um, Durant. If if we want to talk this, uh, I don't. Uh, you and I are similar era. So were you in this, Brian? The uh, like Sega Genesis versus Nintendo right. Super Nintendo. Versus whatever I think it was PlayStation versus N64 for me was the d- decision I had to make. Um, if you were involved in any of those consoles, it's like we we talk the sunk cost fallacy a lot on the show, but it's common that that humans when they are invested in something yes. will just automatically inflate its value because they have to. As you're pointing out, you are locked into Curry. Curry's not leaving, and if he the the the, the problem is the number of players you could trade Curry for at this point that would be better for your team. Is, is virtually non-existent. Uh, the contracts would have to line up. The teams would have to agree. And it's, it's you know, there there are players that I might prefer to Curry at this point. Absolutely. Actually, Kevin Durant's one of them is what it is. But 
that's just not happening. So you, as you're mentioning, your, your team is locked in for the long run. And so they're, they're doing the, I bought a Nintendo, so Sega Genesis is stupid. <laughs> that, that's a good way to put it. That's exactly right. If we're in a different scenario right now in the real world, which is something like, this would never happen, but let's just say the Warriors are capped out and they can get one ma- Supermax deal and that's it. And Curry and Durant are both not signed and they're both begging Joe Lake up, oh, we both want to sign you a Supermax. And for some reason they have to pick between one or the other. If we're in that situation, maybe it'd be a different story. People would be like, ooh, I don't know. This is a tough Ram. call. But that's not the world we're in, right? We're in the world where Curry is the leader of the franchise, and he has been in the past. So all the fans are going to side with Curry, regardless of what's going on in the court. Well, and just to reiterate a point we've made a billion times before, too, is what I get frustrated about in the NBA and in sports in general is when you ignore the reality of the world or game you are in. And then try and go there. This is a very common libertarian method of doing <laughs> so that going, Government is stupid. We shouldn't have government. And you go, okay, well, look it. There is no way that any of us can divorce ourselves from the fact that, you know, there are roads that were built by government. We're on an internet system that was built largely with government funding. Uh, yeah. Way back in the day, presidents put, you know, um, who was it? Was This was the New Deal with, um, uh, how did I just drop Roosevelt, the name? Roosevelt, FDR. F- yeah. For whatever reason, I want to say Eisenhower. Slightly different, although people should have heeded his warning on the military. They both have very long, multisyllabic last names. Thank you for that out, Brian, although I think Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take the L and say that was a mistake on my (laughs) presidential history. But, you know, FDR did all of this stuff, you know, getting electricity and stuff to people. That world exists. So if you're saying, I don't want any government intervention, then you go, okay, well, what you need to do first is get out your checkbook and write a giant check to the society you've existed in that has given you those things. Because even even at the worst end in the United States, this was a, a point brought up in the book Soccernomics, but in the worst end in the United States is still pretty well off. Uh, he in, in the book Soccernomics, he brought up this idea of the underdog story for British soccer stars and even NBA stars. We have this, right, where you go, ah, oh, this kid came from nothing uh, and trained really hard and became a soccer star. And his example uh, for this British star that had that background was – this guy lived in a one bedroom apartment where they had a washing machine that they had to share on the roof. So obviously any of us in, you know, the, you know, the United States, Britain, we think of that. We're like, Oh my God, what a slum. There are some countries. And he mentioned some South African countries that had started getting soccer teams that just could not compete at the world stage. Like there are some countries that that same quality of life is just monumentally different. And that means a different thing. So it's like when you want to exist in the system of, I have this thought, Step one, remove the world as it exists. I I hate that. And that's the problem with this Curry-Durant scenario. As we've noted, the draft exists. As long as the draft existed, I I, I saw some back and forth going on. Someone someone on Twitter says, Tyler Conway responded to this. I loved it. But someone on Twitter was like, you know what? The problem with the NBA is owners need to get more control. (laughs) (laughs) And Conway's like, I've got nothing for you if that's your take. Just you might as well mute or block me. I think he said something like that. But it's like, The draft exists. There is no such thing as loyalty in a league where the draft exists. There is no such thing as a free market for players when there are drafts, restricted free agency, and max salaries. So these these kind of very capitalistic ideals that people want to throw out, they do not exist in the NBA. When we remove the draft, when we remove max salaries, when we allow – Differing types of competitive bargaining that aren't restricted free agency. We this wasn't even on the script, Brian, but uh, I know in Major League Baseball there's definitely some interesting stuff going on with with owners allegedly colluding, where players are going, I got the same salary offer from four teams at the same time, which implies that the owners are talking to each other, saying to suppress max starters' salaries, nobody offer more than this much for these players, that kind of stuff. So as long as that world exists, we don't get to argue about loyalty. And that that's the only point I got to, and I keep comparing this to wrestling. It's like, yeah, when you watch a wrestling program, which we'll talk more later, and you're like, I can't believe Stone Cold Steve Austin, how, how much he, he hates the man and all this and that. It's like, this is scripted. Even if it's based on something in reality, it's a show. And the NBA and a lot of sports is the same thing. When we're, when we're arguing this about Durant versus Curry, it's theater and the media knows it. And that just is what it is. Yeah. And that kind of ties in to the next uh, few comments we had here. Um, we had a few from rebounds and threes you were, you were talking to. 
And yeah, he's he's saying that Curry went a little bit farther down the draft, right? He got he's kind of the underdog story, right? This has always been an interesting story to me because he is kind of a smaller guy compared to the NBA, even though he's like six three and actually pretty big. And he and you know he had an NBA father, right? So he grew up as a kid playing on NBA court. So he really wasn't an underdog, but oh, yeah. he has the perception of an underdog, right? Went to a smaller school, seems like a normal guy, and doesn't act like a diva on camera anyway so yeah that so that's my answer to rebounds and threes is yeah it's a perception kind of thing he also mentions danny green um has been big for the raptors we were talking about the raptors a little bit and because we were noting that regardless of what you want to say about the spurs the spurs with Kawhi are better than the spurs without Kawhi. and to the same theater there is no world where the spurs can try and play this uh do you have you you have we both have cats brian has this happened to you this has to be a universal cat story so (laughs) You're sitting somewhere where there's a ledge. I used to have a, a windowsill that my cat would, would sit on. Cat tries to jump up. Cat just beefs it, fall, you know, either doesn't yeah. land or scratches, falls on the ground, just boom, makes a ton of noise. You're sitting at the computer. You look over, and the cat just, like, gets up and just, like, saunters away. It's like, yeah, I, m- I meant to do that. And you're like, no, we, we both know what happened there. We both know the reason you're not sitting in the windowsill is you're embarrassed and you're trying to save face and walk out, cat. You're not fooling anybody. The Spurs with Kawhi are like that. Even with how well they're doing now, they don't get to play the ah. Uh, we didn't. Who needs Kawhi anyway? They offered him a max deal, and as soon as they did that, I was like, "Oh, this is over. This is hilarious." And I, I'm still amazed at how it came up. But then the bigger point about that trade is, in that trade, the Spurs traded out Kawhi and Danny Green to get DeRozan. DeRozan's playing fine, but Danny Green, as a quote unquote role player, is arguably playing better for the Raptors. So, what's funny is the Raptors, irrespective of Kawhi one could argue, won that trade. And if you're a fan of Arturo Galetti's on Twitter, American Numbers, his argument has been that come playoff time, um, DeMar DeRozan kind of turns into a chucker and ha- has has shot the Raptors out of some playoffs in the past. So we'll have to see what, what DeMar DeRozan looks like come playoff time for the Spurs. Yeah, and just to finish up, we had one more comment here. Another great long-time comment. Oh, we got a few more, actually. I didn't see them all. So from uh, D- you got to scroll down on the internet sometimes, Dre, to see all the comments. Uh, from DG22, he asked a question: Why is it bullshit for fans to like their own players who has been around longer and has signaled he wants to be around longer in the future? That's a really good question, and I didn't explain my point very well. So, but uh, you go first, Dre. Yeah, like I said, my my short terse answer with what I all the babbling I just did is that that rea- that reality is false. There is no. Curry did not want to be there. You, you've told me this story, Brian, yeah. when he, after he was unhappy. Arguing Curry is loyal when they can offer the best deal, We, you know, it, it, it's a show. That, that, that's my But that's sense. part of the appeal to the fans, though, right, Dre, is that Curry didn't want to be there, but we as fans won him over, and now he loves the air, so he's one of us. So, <laughs> we'll, well, yeah, we'll go back to that word bullshit. So I will, I will, like, split this up into two different things here. And I'll make a distinction. Um, so the original question I was trying to answer was, who's a better player? Who's a better NBA player, Curry or Durant? That's a tougher call, right? Curry has had that one ridiculous season and maybe more team success than Durant. But Durant's had all these great seasons, right? So you could maybe say, well, if you're just say, talking about Hall of Fame points, right? Like they're both easily going to make the Hall of Fame. But First. who has a few more? May, right now, maybe it's Durant. Like maybe you can say Durant's a better player, but I want to differentiate that from who do the fans like the most and this all this loyalty stuff, right? So, my answer to DG Twenty Two is what I'm saying is people's thoughts about loyalty and wanting who wants to be around and whatnot. I think that's bleeding over into their analysis of how good of a player they are, right? And I'll. Yeah, And I'll finish this up with like another wrestling point is one of the things about professional wrestling as a show is sometimes the most compelling show is when you don't force a guy. So what wrestling will do, as we mentioned, it's scripted is a lot of times I'll have someone come out like Roman Reigns, who did come up on John Oliver's thing. Uh, and they'll bring out Roman Reigns and say, this guy, he is sculpted. He is an Adonis, right? You should like him. He is a hero. He is Superman. He even had a move called the Superman punch. <laughs> we want you to cheer for this guy. 
that's that's what the, what they try and sell you. And the fans are like, we don't like this guy. Then you have people like Mick Foley, who was missing part of his ear, uh, had scars from so much fighting, is missing some of his teeth. Uh, you know, overweight guy does not look like a hero, but the fans are like, we really like this this guy, how he talks, how he fights, what happened. You know, he's the underdog. We like him. So the, the smart move to do for wrestling and when they do well is when they do this, they go, oh, the fans want to boo this guy. Let's give them an excuse to boo this guy. And there are effective ways you can do that with Roman Reigns. You go, we're going to make him the villain by doing these things. Now, they might not seem villainous, but we let the fans do the villain, villainry. And then there are times like, oh, this guy's the hero. We're going to turn him into the hero. And as you're kind of noting, the, the change the narrative because Steph Curry – Drafted top 10, son of an NBA player. There is no underdog story there, but you sell it as an underdog story. Yep. Wrestling will do that. You leave out. You're like, oh, just just forget the fact that two years ago he tried to kill the boss's daughter or something. Nah, he's a hero now, right? Whatever. <laughs> that's that's what NBA media does. And so I think the real kind of capper to this, and I'll let us move on after it, is that sad to say Steph Curry is a great baby face, and it's not hard to push him as a baby face in the NBA Kevin Durant just is not a baby face. And Kevin Durant's kind of trying to push himself as, hey, you you all should be cheering me. And I understand that. But at least in like wrestling lore, he's definitely more of a heel. And, you know, maybe you should embrace the heel role. All right. Let's uh, I'm going to try and condense a lot of stuff quickly, Brian, because these are sensitive subjects. Yeah. So we, we talked a little Tom Izzo last week and the bullshit. And KS47 kind of came to Tom Izzo's defense and says, hey, this isn't who Tom Izzo is. Don't, you know, normally off the court, he's fine, but just why are you mad at this? And uh, over at Cracked back in the day, Jason Pargin, a.k.a. David Wong, wrote this these weird things that we all believe. And one of the things he said is that we have an entirely different person living inside of us. And so whenever you get apologies, public apologies, you'll hear, I'm not a racist, I'm not a sexist, I'm not a blah, et cetera, et cetera, right? That wasn't me. And you go, well, no, you did it. That was you. And that always gets rough, too, when you're trying to judge a person that we normally like doing an act that we dislike. And at least on the Tom Izzo case, all I can say is that kind of behavior has become acceptable in college sports, and we're not okay with it. And even if you try and argue, well, Tom Izzo's not that guy, first off, sorry, clearly, yes, he is. And whatever circumstances and attitudes and beliefs that exist that allowed him to believe even that second that that was acceptable or that after the fact, I, I'd say the bigger problem is after the fact, people were defending it. After it, he just said, I lost my temper. That was unacceptable. I will never do that again or I'll try my best to never do it again. And, and we all came out and said this was unacceptable. He should get a technical, you know, he should get a technical and a fine, blah, 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 blah. That's one thing. Whereas, as we noted on last week's show, Coach Nick had so many back and forths with people going, ah, this generation is soft, all ah, these players, all ah, this whatever. I, I did that and I turned out fine. I do that. I'm fine, right? So that was our point there. Now, the other annoying part about the not the person, I'm going to try and make this quick, Brian, because it's a weird meta commentary. There is a situation going on in Dallas right now with a high profile NBA star. And I hate to tell you this being from the past, this is going to be bad you're not going to be happy with how this turns out because there has been a police report issued for an NBA star about sexual assault and some graphic details. I'm not going to, I don't feel comfortable repeating the, the details about it because there's also some racism involved. The issue is the police investigation is not done. So regardless of what happens, the person who filed the report it's it's over at this point, right? The you, the the fan we we've seen this happen before, right? The fans have already there are already fans coming to the defense, et cetera, et cetera. Chris Stapps Porzingis, that that is who it is, by the way. So you can Google it now if you want to. The the terse thing he said is, you know, that they're making it up. So this is bad from so many fronts because first off, I'll say the it's. The, the honest being to not believe the victim is very frustrating in these cases. We've seen that before. Additionally, no matter what the outcome, it's not good because even if she's vindicated, she is going to be a pariah. We, we've seen that happen before in the past. For those that don't remember, Kobe Bryant had a sexual assault case in Colorado. He even – he came out and said things that basically said, I understand why she thinks that but I didn't do it, which is just bonkers to me. And the more frustrating part, too, is because Kobe Bryant was still a viable NBA player, he got a pass. 
the the NBA after that, I, I heard things where people, sideline reporters are basically told, you don't bring up Colorado. You don't bring up the rape case for Kobe Bryant. So I'm saying this doesn't end well no matter what happens. And I'm not happy either with the fact that basically what happened is the New York Post found the police report and started reporting on it. And so now you've got this very hard problem that we already have in these issues with society, which is the legal process for reporting sexual assault in the United States is so rough on the victim that, uh, as an example, Woody Allen, one of his children, there was a big case with it. The lawyer basically said, I think we're right, but I think it's better for the kid's long-term health to just not be in this court case. We're going to drop the charges because the process of trying to vindicate this person is not going to make up for the harm that's going to be caused to them throughout the process. So in that regard, first off, the I know this person, they don't act like that. That is, I get so frustrated when people say it, but I also get increasingly frustrated. This is like when a wash bomb goes bad, I'm like, we don't know the full story. Everybody shouldn't be looking. And the people that are going to immediately jump to decisions are basically going to make this harder for every future victim. And I'll, I'll echo what other people have said. If this happened to her, then it is completely unacceptable. And I hope, you know, the law works out like it's supposed to. And uh, Mark Cuban has, unfortunately, maybe he's listened, like, um, I've heard that he's basically taking radio silence, and as we've mentioned, it's, it's frustrating, but in the social media era, in the era of people you know, looking for clickbait headlines, basically not engaging is the right maneuver, and that can be good or bad. Anyway. Yay. Those- <laughs> okay, well, we got, we got that in there. Um, I, I, don't, I haven't read anything about this story yet. I, you just told me about the other day. So, yeah, I just don't have any comment on it. Um, I don't know if you want to go back to Izzo. I want to really separate those two things out but or just move forward. I don't know. It was just going for the – It's when, when people immediately hop to defensive people and they go, how can you think that this is unacceptable? And you go, there is nothing that says a person that you've known forever – is not That's going fair. to be acceptable in some cases. But I will agree. Izzo, unacceptable that what what Christos Rosingas is a, allegedly accused of a million times worse. But I, I'm, I'm even just more angry going, this is going to get worse and there is no outcome for the victim that is going to, to end good. And uh, that, that frustrates me. There's, you know, it's annoying when you watch movies like you, you brought up Game of Thrones on the show. I'm going to try and get this back to lightheartedness. Like you have Game of Thrones on the show, Brian, and you're just like, yeah, sometimes – no, nobody wins. Nobody, but, nobody wins. Let's try. Let's go as as stupid and fan fandomy as possible, Brian. Um, this was an interesting point. So Nikola Jokic, in a very close game against the Washington Wizards, was fouled out. Fa- or was teed out. Sorry, I didn't. He fouled out because of technical. So he was teed out. Fouled out. What happened was in the game, Bobby Portis was essentially jumping on Jokic's back, and he got frustrated, and he went up to the ref and said, "That's a foul." And the ref teed him up, and then the ref said, do you want another technical? And Jokic said, I don't care. He got a second technical out ejected. This was a game that went – it was a a three-point game at one point, so really close to the wire. It was obviously bad that Jokic got ejected. Uh, Another point that people have been bringing up is just the rate at which he draws fouls. If you compare Nikola Jokic to Joel Embiid, Jokic gets about 23% fouls drawn despite taking roughly the same number around the hoop as Joel Embiid, whereas Joel Embiid gets 63% fouls called. One difference I noted was that Joel Embiid takes a lot more dunks. He takes about 10 times the number of dunks as Jokic. And I really wonder to perception of refs if that's better. If you, if you dunk and get hit and you go, ah, they're more likely to call a foul than if you know you do. Uh, Jokic has all these amazing moves, these drops, whatever. So... One, I'm curious just on that from just uh, an observational point. And two, there's a, a thing that I've seen James, James, not James Ricardo, sorry, Ian Levy and Arturo Galetti have both brought up before that younger teams tend to do worse in the playoffs because they don't have the star cachet. That refs do tend to seem to give a little more respect to older players, older teams. And so this could be a problem for the Nuggets come playoff time because they are they are one of the youngest teams in the NBA. And Jokic, I think this is just for, you know, if you're a Nuggets fan, he's been on your radar for years. But if you're a mainstream fan, this is probably the first year he's on your radar. So so that could fare poorly. I think, unfortunately, we were going to talk a little bit about this. They were briefly jostling for the number one seed 
with the Warriors. I think their remaining schedule and the fact that the Nuggets lost a few games they needed to win, including this Washington game, means the Warriors are going to take it. Uh, the Nuggets well, the, tomorrow night. I mean, if the Nuggets get that game, they're still back in it. They're only half a game up, so I mean, even even in that case. But yeah, it's a must win if they want the top seed. Probably must win just to try and avoid a lot of the clustering happening. So so we'll have to see what happens there. Yeah, they could still get passed by the Rockets in theory, right? But it's not very likely. Yeah, we'll see. And then Portland's interesting. Oh yeah, I was I forgot to put this on the script, Brian. But we, I was going to say the Madden curse. This absolutely sucks. Mm. So neat on uh, as a. Uh, what is this for? Is it Nikola? What is it? Uh, Yusuf. Yusuf Nurkic. Yeah, that's right. So Yusuf Nurkic uh, was a player that didn't play that well for the Denver Nuggets, was traded to the Portland Trailblazers. I said, good riddance. He looked really, really good, then got injured, and I said, oh, that sucks. Then he played okay, and I said, okay, he's a good player, and he got a reasonable contract for it. Then this season, he looked like a star. The, the Portland Trailblazers have been doing amazing, and you could argue that Nurkic was it. And you and I have had discussions on the show of like, Really, if you want to believe the Portland Trailblazers are for real, boils down to if you believe Nurkic is for real, because we we've always yeah. established Lillard as a star. We think Lillard is probably you know, Lillard's I'll just. I'll pump the brakes on that a little bit. I was down on him early in his career, but I will yeah. say now he's definitely one of the best point guards. Well, no, uh, oh Lillard, I thought you were talking Nurkic, but yeah, no, yeah. no Lillard. Been good. I, I think Maury Ball definitely helped him out. We yes. we were looking at that. We were like, this guy shoots threes. Why is he only shooting that many threes? And I think it became slightly more acceptable, and he's like, cool, I'm going to shoot away. So we basically said this team has two stars and a bunch of good players, so they're for real If, if as long as you think Nurkic is for real. Nurkic got a horrific injury, and fuck the ref, by the way. Um, I, I have not watched the clip of the injury. I can't bring myself to do that. There have been a couple other injuries, including like David Lee's, that I still haven't brought myself around to watching, Brian. But after this happened, there was a referee walking around, and he basically – not super hard, but he wasn't watching where he was going, and he kicked Nurkic in his injured leg. So, fuck yeah, that. that happened. I haven't heard the fallout, like what he said he was thinking at the time, but yeah, I watched it when it happened, yeah. And it was just, but anyway, so that really sucks for Nurkic. We thought he was playing amazing. We thought he was for real. We'll see how the Portland Trailblazers do in the playoffs, but that, that just really, really sucks. My and only we... comment on that, Dre, before we keep going, is I get so mad whenever I see people actually even james harden did this recently james harden said oh this load management is bullshit you should play a million billion minutes like me well when did nurkic get hurt it was at the end of double overtime after he played a full game like playing a lot of minutes and then playing overtime after you play a lot of minutes that's hard on you and you're more likely to get injured so yeah teams well, should pay attention to load man load management when they see this nurkic injury and then also, additional to that, like the Harden versus Nurkic, there, there's a very real difference. I mean, every extra inch of height you are, that is a completely different body. And I should say, I think Harden made this statement before Nurkic got hurt. Yeah, he wasn't I, I, trying to dance on his grave or anything. I don't think Harden would have been that stupid. No. But yeah, it, it, but it is, I, I think, I saw Stan Van Gundy at Sloan make the comment where he's just like, if we're going to play players less, you should expect to win less. And that's just a no duh. Yeah. I, and that's fine, but I think it is also I, – I'm I've loved Greg Popovich. I've loved Phil Jackson, two of the most successful NBA coaches of all time. Both of these people in the 90s recognized, you know what? My goal is to have my stars healthy for the playoffs. I don't need to – you know, yes, better seating is helpful, and if you can get it, that's useful. But a healthy Shaquille O'Neal can beat any team home or away, right? That can happen. An unhealthy Shaq, even if we have home court advantage and are playing the seventh seed, that can be enough to turn the tide. So I agree with what we're saying on, on people that are like, ah, oh, you know, the, the players are soft. It's like there is a place for getting upset with people for being too sensitive. And we all know these people. And by the way, this is not a partisan thing. It exists. I, it would be nice if we came together as a group, as humanity, if we came together and just accepted that across all walks of life, all creeds, they are fucking idiots that get overly upset about stupid things that they shouldn't, that we can all be upset with. The people that get mad at Starbucks cups or, you know, what's interesting is I'm actually going to say stand-up comedians that make fun of vegans are more sensitive. I've, I haven't met, like, I've never in my life met the overbearing vegan. I have seen so many stand-up comics that have at least 10 minutes of material on vegans. So, but I'll throw that out there, right? The person who gets overly offended, overly upset, obnoxious about something those people are sensitive, are soft. We can call them whatever we want. Hopefully, is a less diminutive term, but fine, right? Snowflakes I, is the current term. Snowflakes. Use, right? But, I, but I, what, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to avoid any specific partisan or you know the attack millennials. I'm saying 
there are every there are a lot of people like this and they exist everywhere. And fine, if you want to get mad at it. You cannot call a professional athlete that spend, you know, first off, every hour on the court they spend in a game, you know they spent at least yeah. an hour in the gym. They have a, a, a different lifestyle, you know, all the travel. Anybody that's done work travel, I mean, imagine doing that for a lot of time. We're going to talk wrestling maybe in a little and that might come up. It's like there is a place to call someone overly sensitive. And it's when they're like, oh, man, this cookie was bad. I'm going to give this restaurant a three-star review on Yelp. Fine. Call that person soft. I'll be like, yeah, you're right. You don't get to call the professional athlete, the seven footer that just, as you noted, played like 40 minutes of basketball in a season where he's already played 2000 minutes that got a horrific injury. You don't get to say back in my day, we would have just played more. It's like, no, back in your day, your career ends early. And there, there are a lot of stars. Like we think Charles Barkley is one of the greatest NBA players ever. And he did his career. Basically he got an injury when he was, I believe with the Rockets and it was just done. Like it was, it was game over. So I agree with you, Brian. Load yeah. yeah. Well, is it, is it time to get into wrestling, or do we have more NBA stuff? Oh, I think we do have more NBA stuff. Oh, we got Trey Young. Yeah, I did want to talk this. So um, Bill James, father of, of modern sports analytics, came up with the term the BS win. This is a very tongue-in-cheek thing. i got to give him full props. It's called the oh, One thing I'll say on Bill James, he's not doing very well on Twitter lately. He's kind of getting destroyed about stuff. So uh, Bill James, you got to clean up your act a little bit. Well, I think I'll, I'll take a step back to take this as a, as a bigger point and include us on it too, Brian. When you see someone you like, an expert in some field, or in, in some cases, like I think like Malcolm Gladwell, I've noted this too, Malcolm Gladwell is an expert storyteller. You basically give Malcolm Gladwell a story, you give him a set of data, you give him some information, and he can put it together and spit out an amazing story, a compelling story. You know, Whereas I might give you a table, I might give you an Excel spreadsheet with a bunch of pivot tables and go, oh my God, Brian, look at this. Malcolm Gladwell might come out and talk about how Allen Iverson is overrated and that catches on. But Malcolm Gladwell is not an expert on other things. And so when you see Malcolm Gladwell talk about things where he is not a subject matter expert, where maybe he's covered that subject, he's done somebody else's research, but where he himself starts making up his own hypotheses and theories is where we see Malcolm Gladwell get into trouble. And I've seen people that are upset with Malcolm Gladwell about that to the fact that Somewhat like the 10,000 hour rule, which is some of the most famous research Malcolm Gladwell has covered. That's not his research, that other people's research. The people doing that research years later came out and were like, oh, yeah, um, the story he told, compelling, great. We don't agree with the final takeaway that he managed to use for that. Same thing when you see Bill James. Bill James was someone who studied basketball a lot and writing a lot. He was a writer and a basketball stats. And I think he also is into like true crime. But when you go up to Bill James. Well, baseball and, first though, right? Baseball, I Sorry, I said basketball. No, yeah. he's actually not a good basketball analytics guy, but that's neither here nor there. I got to do a flyer on him back in the day, which is the thing he came up with, which is you find someone make an anecdotal claim. You go look at the data and you're like, oh, their anecdote is wrong. Someone's like, I remember when I was a kid watching the, the Brewers, they always, you know, would blow up lefties in August because of whatever bullshit reason and you look up the data and you're like no they didn't that's you're just making that up i've got i got to do that on bill james back in the day and some basketball stuff he was talking but anyway when you think about an expert like that and you see him talk about other stuff you're like that's not your field or profession and that's happened to us too where we where we wander off the beaten path or things we haven't researched and you're like oh wow you can make a really bad take so with bill james it's like <laughs> yeah I, I watch him talk about things not baseball or even things that are like slightly related to baseball but not related to analytics sometimes i'm like oh man and it makes me sad it makes me sad when my when you know people that i was like a fan of you know malcolm gladwell i bring him up a lot because i quote him a lot on the show because he's covered a lot of stuff we we really enjoy including dave barry's work but like he came out and was like saying man this new yorker festival that says they don't want these you know alt-right people to attend i mean what happened to you know having people that get together and and you know have a communication of ideas and i was just like don't come on man it's like what do you <laughs> Anyway, okay, so back to the good stuff about Bill James. It's just old, old work, right? It's like wrestling, right? His good stuff was in the 80s. Okay, came up with a term called the BS win, blown save win. The way it works in baseball, you get a win if your team is ahead at the end of the last inning you pitch. Now, the funny thing about baseball is you, if you're away, you pitch first. So I might pitch an inning and give up three runs. So we're down 0-3. And you have to pitch at least six innings. Or And there there's some rules for relief pitching, right? The game has to be within so many runs to count. But for instance, we could be up by a run in the in the bottom of the ninth or in the top of the ninth. My pitcher gives up two runs, but pitch but completes the inning. So we're down we're down uh, two to three. My team rallies. We win the game four to three. I get the win. In baseball, that is a statistic that is tracked 
to pitchers. They get the win if they were the if they completed the inning in the inning which the scoring run was scored with some other um, fanciness around it. So that's a BS win because obviously the pitcher's getting credit for a win, but they didn't win the game. Arguably, they they almost lost the game. I said there needs to be a term for this kind of shot because Trey Young against the Milwaukee Bucks in a completely meaningless game, the Bucks were seeding, I think, most of their starters except for Brooke Lopez. The Hawks, because they are so bad, don't have to worry about tanking, so they were playing all of their starters, maybe to get them burned, maybe to get Trey Young some more love for uh, Rookie of the Year. Trey Young gets the game winner, but I believe he went something like 6 for 19 in the game, and I think he scored 12 points on 19 shots. And you go, you do not... You should not get credit for the game winner in a game where you shot so badly that had you even shot be- a little below league average, right? So he didn't even need to shoot league average or his own average. If he shot a little below league average, the game's not close. And Dave Barry uh, in the book Wages of Wins made this point. It's a story he has about Michael Jordan, about a clutch shot Michael Jordan had. And all he noticed, he's like, you know what? If Michael Jordan had just shot his career average in that game – they're up by 10 at that point in the game, and there's no need for his clutchness. So I think there definitely does need to be some kind of term like the BS save or BS save, BS win for when a player gets the game winner and you're like, yeah, that game winner shouldn't count because they're, they were only in it. The other team was only in it because you played so poorly. Yeah, and of course, I'm sitting here being you know the usual smug internet nerd saying, well, of course, the real answer is just look at their overall numbers and ignore the end of the game, right? Like, enjoy the game and then, you know, draw a line and say, we're going to just look at the numbers after that. But that's that's not how it goes, right? People love clutch shooting. That's one of their favorite things about basketball. So we are stuck with that for the near future. All right, so next topic to get through. Um, this is just a funny one. It's like a fun trivia question. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But uh, Coach Nick was noting that uh, Thomas Bryant, who helped down my nuggets, so curse you, uh, was waived by the Lakers back in the day. And it is a funny one because while we do actually agree with JaVale McGee, he'd be looking really good for your Warriors, Brian. You might be near 60 wins instead of 50 if you'd uh, kept him around. But Ooh. Can I comment on that real fast? Go for it. Bogut looks absolutely amazing. He's been with the team for two weeks. He's only playing above average, which for him is not great. You know, he's 34 years old, but that's just because of bad shooting and he's been taking a lot of shots. His rebounding, his defense, his passing. He is so good, Dre. I think that's going to be a great signing for them in the playoffs. Actually, you're not wrong. His numbers are looking good, but I, we'll see. We'll see on longevity and if he yeah. can play. You he know can't what? play more than 20 minutes, really, in most likely, but, you know. <laughs> if, anyway, Javel, we, we like JaVale McGee and we like Tyson Chandler, but the, the Lakers, for instance, traded away Larry Nance last season. Um, there's an argument. The argument you can make with Larry Nance is that basically that was to appease LeBron James and like LeBron James and his agency. He didn't want to come to the Lakers unless they made that trade. So if that's true, fine. But so they traded away Larry and Nance. And you're saying last- Larry Nance, he's represented by the same agency as LeBron, right? I believe either either he is or LeBron's agency wanted that to have like told the Lakers they were like, hey, you need to do this if you want. Oh, I see. OK, I, I don't know the full stories. I'd have to look into it. Larry Nance, uh, Randall. I don't actually I mean, Randall's been OK. I wouldn't put him above JaVale McGee, but, you know, people are giving me some credit there. Uh, Brooke Lopez. I don't give much credit there. Thomas Bryant. But there have been a multitude of bigs that the young talented looking bigs uh, our boy uh, Zubats uh, up there Lakers have just let walk so it, it is an amusing one to just go how many good talented young bigs is this team going to let walk and by the way uh, to Lakers fans just the last nail is Kuzma was god awful um, Kuzma screwed that team if you if you know it, it's easy to point the blame at various people Rajon Rondo had like the best game of the night the other night if he'd been healthy half the season instead and of even less. For most of the year, Dre, Kuzma had the most minutes played on the Lakers, even more than LeBron. We can double check that right now, but that's yeah, yeah. the real problem. The real D'Angelo Russell story isn't that D'Angelo Russell was this elite player that they let walk to Brooklyn. That is bullshit. He's still a below average player, and I call him a Jabari Parker bullet. The reason I mention that is when you have these young players, Donovan Mitchell may be in the same boat. When you have a young player that has not yet hit that hump where they're a good player going into their fifth NBA season, their team has to make a decision. They either pay him a lot of money 
or they let them walk. And the problem is teams don't like losing face and giving up, especially when the player is perceived as a star. Carmelo Anthony was an example of this. By his fourth year in the NBA, he didn't look great. The the wise, prudent move would have been to say, I think he made an all-star game by that point, would have been to say, trade Carmelo Anthony away now when his stock is as high as it's been, as opposed to giving him you know, a quarter of our salary cap and hope that he improves. And he did improve, although not worth the money. So D'Angelo Russell's in that same boat where he's not good yet. And he's going to command a lot of money. He just made the all-star game. He's scoring 20 points a game. Good God. And a lot of people are going with the narrative, can you believe how stupid the the Lakers were to let him walk? No, the real story is the Lakers traded for Kuzma, who initially looked good and then have not given up on him. And they're playing him, like you said, the most minutes on the team. And he is terrible. And Kuzma replaced with an average guard. You know, that team would have been sniffing the playoffs. So... It makes me a little little sad, but basically, if, if you want to be mad about that team, it's Kuzma and Ingram. And Lakers fans that are like, oh my God, LeBron screwed everything up. It's like, you would have had Kuzma and Ingram and probably not any players of the caliber of Rondo, JaVale, and LeBron on your team this year. Yeah, it's funny you put it that way because it's. I think it's so true. Um, the NBA needs some more outsiders in their decision making because when you, as you were talking through that you know mindset right there, and saying, yeah, they just want to save face and, you know, be careful here. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Teams do that all the time. But then I'm thinking in the back of my head, God, if that were me, I'd be trying to do some arbitrage right now, right? You take this perception and actually use it to help the team. But, yeah, people are just risk adverse, I guess, in the NBA. So the one last thing that I've mentioned before that I at least want to give a little credit to is that there are a lot of behind-the-scenes dealings in the NBA, like I just mentioned, agent stables, where people like yeah. agents have power or players have power. You know, someone says, I don't want, you know, if James, if, if James Harden comes up to you and says, fuck Chris Paul, I don't want to play with Chris Paul, wh- what do you do his, if his contract is coming up? And that that's the, you know, that's the funny, the, the fake scenario that doesn't exist, but the scenario people are bringing up with Kevin Durant about like, what do you do as a team if that, if that scenario comes up? And then it is, it is very much like going for it on fourth down. Most teams, when they force the player to blink, the player blinks and they come back to the team and they take the contract. But when they when they don't blink, when they Paul George it up or whatever, it's like that's when you look silly. So, or or you know the most recent example, Kawhi Leonard. When that happens, the team looks silly and don't want to do it. So I mean, I give respect to saying there's a lot of stuff that we the fans aren't privy to. So it's a lot easier to say I would make this cold, detached take from up here without without not not even without not knowing this stuff without having to deal with this stuff. And as soon as you have to deal with it, I'm not saying it's rational, but I'm saying I, I give a little bit of cred. Just a hat tip to this, Brian, uh, both Chris Bosch and Mano Ginobili got their jerseys retired. Um, yeah, good, good job. Like Mano Ginobili is amazing. Chris Bosch. I, I, I don't know if Toronto has yet or will, but uh, Miami retired his jersey. I saw Jeff, like Jeff Perlman has written some books I like, but then also it's, we're in the same boat, by the way, I'm sure, Brian. Like, we say lots of stuff about basketball. I always laugh. There are a lot of people on Twitter that will follow me, and I, I look, and it's like, you know, basketball fan, go Brewers, follower in Christ. And I'm like, I'm sure this is going to get interesting for you on the day that I get really upset about something. <laughs> or the same thing when, when I see someone who's like, go Bucks, NBA forever. And I'm like, I'm going to have a random day where I'm just going to be spouting off about Babylon 5. Um Sorry in advance. I don't say it to him, but I'm saying I think that. So I'm sure it's the same way for everybody, right? You have someone that you like for something they they do, which we just mentioned, and they start talking about other stuff, and you're like, oh, God, shut up. Although in this case, Jeff Perlman is a sports writer, so I don't know. But Jeff Perlman was like, has Chris Bosh really done anything to deserve having his jersey retired by the Pete? And I'm like, are you – we even agree, by the way. We agree that his numbers took a dip when he played with Miami because he was the odd man out. There, are, we, We've said this before in team construction. This is the Brian Bins of productivity. When you are putting a team together, when people come up with this stupid, uh, annoying scenario of, well, if you had a team of Ben Wallace and Dennis Rodman and Tyreek uh, – not Tyreek Evans. I'm trying to think of like Dennis Rodman, Ben Wallace. I'm trying to think of other good I names. Take Tyreek Evans. Uh, Dikembe Mutombo, Tyreek Evans went healthy. It's pretty good. Dikembe Mutombo, you know, basically you focus on the defensive-minded bigs, DeAndre Jordan, players like that that are, are really good at things but not usage players, passers. They couldn't beat a team of five Kobe's or whatever. And you go, well, the, the game, the goal of the game is to bring a team of five players together that are good at passing and shooting and rebounding and defense, et cetera. Yeah. So, no duh. But the, so there can be diminishing returns. 
Chris Bosh was amazingly good around the hoop. If you if you looked at his shot chart and his rebound numbers, basically Chris Bosh could live at the hoop and be a 2010 machine in Toronto, which is what he did. He gets to Miami. Dwayne Wade's not really an outside shooter. He's really a cutter. LeBron James loves the hoop. And you're like, well, there are rules about how many people are allowed to be there and floor spacing and whatever. It's like somebody's going to take fewer shots. Somebody's going to be by the hoop less often. It's you, Chris Bosh. So Chris Bosh, we even said his Miami numbers did not look as good as we think they probably would have looked on a team with even just better construction. So, I mean, he could have been on a team with players of LeBron James's caliber. The, the team I've always, like, just makes me so sad, Brian, is if, if the uh, Detroit Pistons had drafted Chris Bosh instead of uh, Darko. Oh, my God, that would have been he – was, he was such a perfect fit. He was such an amazing – Or let's up- say Chris, Chris Bosh is 10 years younger. If he gets to play as a power forward in the league now – where you get to shoot a lot of outside shots, but still, you know, rebound and whatnot. Yeah, he could have been better, but yeah, having him as a center that plays outside, yeah, that wasn't as great as for his numbers. Yeah. So his, but I mean, he played him. He played well. He helped him to a couple titles. He was a good player. Yeah, and then he retire early because of blood clots in the lung. So it's one of these where he's like, does Chris Bosh really deserve his number retired? I was like, shut the hell up. I'm like, of course, yes. Well, and think I, about a number retirement, right? It's really for the fans. And what do the fans want? They want to celebrate those players that won that title or those multiple two titles, was it? I can't or three. I can't remember with the Heat. But anyway, yeah, he was instrumental for those teams. And I mean, and also it, it, we, we talked this little last week where it gets very frustrating when people want to raise the bar on things that are already elite. It's like I don't, I don't, if, I don't think there is a problem with retiring jerseys for players that have done really well beyond you know the logistics of maybe running out of numbers you're allowed to use, right? But it's just going. My my threshold, if I was an NBA owner, is if a player contributed meaningfully to a title, they get their jersey retired. And like the the Celtics, by the way, for what it's worth, are like this. There are some players, I think, are like Cedric Maxwell. I think it's snubbed from the Hall of Fame and, you know, didn't make as many all-star games as he deserved. His jersey's retired by the Celtics. Good on him. Whereas Horace Grant, as an example, because he left the Bulls, um, you know, he got upset after Michael Jordan left and, you know, went went for money and accolades and whatever in Orlando helped them do a title, um, a title shot, sorry. A finals didn't win the title. Should have won the title. But because he helped them out, the Bulls are like, we're not going to retire your number. And it's like, I, I hate the pettiness of any squad going – how dare you expect your jersey retired? To get your jersey retired, you have to be here for a hundred years and do this. This is just my personal thing. Like if I owned a team, I'm basically like, if you helped to a title because that is such an amazing thing, or a part of an amazing run like the Run and Gun Sons of the '90s. Yeah, that is the '90s, 2000s, or 2000s, right? Run and Gun Dallas Mavericks of the '90s, Run and Gun Sons of the 2000s. Anyway, if you contribute to that, I'm just like, yeah, I, I don't. There, it's it's really weird how people think being more sparse with praise is somehow makes you better, especially when the person deserves the praise. So that's my take. I'm not going to touch that one. There's a lot of ways I could go with that. All right. So if you have been a mental samurai fan, uh, I have been tracking the advanced box score. I have two of those up. Uh, and then Chris Ye has been keeping it up. He got to, um, he got to interview Dr. Ken who appeared on the second week of the show and Dr. Ken was great. Um, so this those, is not Ken Jong, by the way, who has a sitcom Dr. named Ken. Dr. Ken. This is a different Dr. Ken. D- different Dr. Ken. Okay. So another cool Dr. Ken. So anyway, for those who don't know, uh, Mental Samurai, you're basically hooked up to a mental gy- a metal gyroscope. Sorry. You're whipped around. You have um, five minutes to answer 12 questions. You get that right. You get $10,000. Then you get a minute and a half to answer four questions. You get those right. You get $100,000. You miss a question. You're done. Uh, and I, I, I never put this together, Brian Ryan. Do you remember... I had never put this together before, Brian. Do you remember that that old school weird game with like a bow staff with the four pillars around you where you like had to hit things? I think this is a was, TV game show you're talking about? No, this don't you remember there was a point in time. You you don't remember. These were like in arcades. Maybe you're too old for it, Brian. An arcade. They were they were like arcades or at least sections of arcades, like, you know, if you go to the movie theater and there's the arcade there, where there would be four towers with these lights on them, and you would hit the lights with a staff. No, I've and never seen that before. Maybe I'm too old. It was in a horrible, horrible movie with Ben Affleck called uh, Paycheck, Blank Check, Future Check, something check. Anyway, where Ben Affleck can see the future and it was not a good movie. Anyway, 
I can't believe. I, yeah, I'm, I'm hitting that. But I, I think that the, the reason it's called Samurai and the Towers are based on that. But anyway, there are four different categories. And it, it's been a fun show. Like I said, friend of the show, Chris Yeh, is going to be on it in about a month. We wanted to get caught up. My brain is broken. I started recording the stats and looking at things like how fast you have to go. So I've ruined the show for myself in some ways, Brian, because when I'm watching, I'm like, oh, he's at question 10. And he's only got 80 seconds remaining, and it's it's going to take at least this many. So there's no way in heck he does it. There was a, a person last week that had horrible time management. That was an example. We did get to see two people that were amazing. The winner, and I want to try and get the names right. Uh, the winner, I, I wanted to bring up a chess metaphor because Chris and I had a, a fundamental disagreement kind of. So if, if you go to Chris's uh, – it's just called the Chris Yeh Podcast. It's, it's hosted by Anchor FM. I found it, for instance, I have like Downcast is what I used to listen to my podcast. I was able to find that quickly. But he was talking about Heather Hurley and was noting two different modes of attack to games. And this might appeal to you, Brian, where on the one hand, you can kind of have the I'm going to have a calm demeanor, a calm attitude because it's really important to stay calm. Uh, uh, Joey Gutman, who was a, a pretty strong contestant on week one, didn't make it past the first round, but did really well. I think he made 10 or 11 questions, noted that essentially anxiety mucks with your memory and one of the categories on this game is memory so it is really important to you know breathe stay calm and that's the whole premise of the show they're whipping you around in a gyroscope <laughs> well you're where you're supposed to be calm and answer simple questions the music really dramatic too dre of course they've got dramatic yeah, music. Good, good. dramatic music dramatic lights etc cetera, etc cetera. so heather hurley he said was kind of no nonsense and if you look at her run basically was this her her, her run times are amazing essentially i, I was kind of running it down your answer time, you could basically – some questions you can answer in as quick as six seconds. I think in, in questions where you have to fully listen to something like an audio She visual. works for the Library of Congress. That's awesome. She works for the Library of Congress. She is an amazing, amazing candidate. She's got a, a Milwaukee accent I was able to pick up on. I was like, hey, wait a minute. Okay. Um, but Chris called her no-nonsense, and I disagreed because I watched her and I didn't think she was no-nonsense. But what happened was on the very last question – so she she walked away with 50000 so so not too shabby. But the last question, an image popped up of like a casino – where there was a, a, a card hand shown out, some dice, three dice shown out, and some chips. And she she did it well. She did the strategy well. I'm going to talk another player on that in a second. But she did the strategy well. She was saying out loud, the card, you know, ace, 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 king, or whatever. And then she she said the numbers of the chess, or of the dice out loud. And the question was, what was the sum of the dice in the picture? And it was 11. And she answered nine. But as you were watching, she said four, five, two, right? She said that out loud, and she got it wrong. And what I compared this to, because Chris was saying she was kind of no nonsense and maybe got too much in her own head, and I said I don't think there's too no nonsense. I compared this to a chess blunder, and I'd been there too, because I I was telling Chris because I always bring this back to me. I was playing like a seventeen eighteen hundred in chess and blitz earlier this week. I'm about fourteen to fifteen hundred on chess.com. Nerd numbers if you ever want to play me. And I, I was crushing and I, I knew I was crushing like that. This light bulb went off in my head and I was just like, I've got this. I'm like, I'm going to beat an 1800. This is awesome because I don't beat 1800s that often. And I was I was really close and also beat legit because sometimes in chess you can win by timing the other person out. That's how blitz works. And I, I, I've had I've won that way against higher rated players. But, you, you know, it doesn't count. You're like, I'm down two rooks, but I beat you on time. It's not a real win, Brian. You want the real win. But I blundered it away and I basically told Chris like an email. I was like my – I think in my brain I started going, I've got this and that that knocked me off, right? Just the, that thing there. And so I was going – as she's going, I think she might have known she had it and just was was a blunder. But it was, it was definitely a fun watch. And the other person, as I mentioned, Chris interviewed him was Dr. Ken that I enjoyed. And the reason I enjoyed Dr. Ken is he basically did optimal strategy. He He's someone who – he's a former doctor. He likes playing board games. He likes making board games. And so in this game, he was super optimal with his time. He even did the right strategy on the question that downed him. Essentially, it was just a gap in his pop culture. Uh, have you ever heard of the band called the Chainsmokers? I guess they're an electric band. No, I haven't. I haven't either. It was an. It was. A, it was funny because it was a visual clue. It showed two pictures: a picture of a chain link and like a chain link fence, and then a picture of two smokers. But the smokers, like this is for smoking meat, looked like grills. And so it was like link grills, chain grills. And he, he was trying to talk through it. The funny thing is the clue they gave is name this band. I think if the clue had – if it had been a puzzle, not a knowledge because those are two different categories. If it had been a puzzle and the clue had been something like an annoying habit, I think he could have got it. But he, he did his best. But he, he also kind of recognized it about 40 seconds. It was kind of like I'm just going to have to take a shot in the dark and if I'm right, I get it. And if I'm wrong, I'm out. He was wrong. 
But I really enjoyed Ken on this run because, as I mentioned, I think he did optimal strategy. He answered a question I had, which is, can you answer early? The answer is yes. You still have to wait for the question to be finished asking. But it checks in immediately, whereas if you wait for the question to finish ans- asking from the robotic thing called Ava and then lock in your answer, if you do that, you basically add two seconds to your time. So he did it optimally, which was really cool. But he also showed, and I mean, this this is the right type of game show, right? Like luck is part of the equation. So the person I thought who did it optimally uh, lost just because of a gap in pop culture. And then, you know, the person who did the best on the show who was also playing amazingly well, uh, she just, you know, basically had a blitz, uh, uh, a blunder, a blitz blunder is what I'd call it. So just one thing on that, because, again, I haven't watched this show yet, but it's really starting to intrigue me now. I will watch it soon. I will definitely watch Chris's episode. One of the the fourth question that Dr. Ken had was the way you wrote it on the, your blog here is it's a clip of a hockey goal with the question of a jersey number for the scoring player. That is a can you describe that question a little bit more so it just plays like a brief video and they just have to pull something out of their memory not knowing what they were looking for basically. Yeah, it's called blackout and I think it's one of the harder ones, but they tend it's it's interesting because it's a hard question premise, but I think the level of difficulty in the question is a little easier than some of the others because they show up a quick like almost a YouTube clip. Hey, Brian, check this out. And in this case, it was a hockey goal. So I think it took about 10 seconds. And, you know, number nine skates by number 19 scores a goal, goes around the thing and the goalie falls over. So he sees that then they black out the image and say, what did you just see? And sometimes they do just an image where they show you an image for a few seconds uh, there was another guy where they were like in a kitchen, a mother and son were in the kitchen and he had cucumbers over his eyes and she was chopping salads. So, you know, it's kind of one of those cute stock photos of like making salad together. And the end of the question was, what was, what was the kid holding in front of his eyes? The question uh, that Heather got that I was just wicked impressed with because I, you know, I'm basically cheating as I'm watching, because I'm recording the stats, what happens is I know what markers to look for. So I will, I will either pause the show to get the time if I need to find the time off the timer or know what I'm looking at to, you know, I'll get a screenshot of the question or something as I'm going along. So I had it paused. I had her question paused and I got it wrong because it was a picture of a juggler and he had a, bo- a red bowling pin in his right hand and a yellow bowling pin in his left hand. And they said, what bowling pin is in his left hand? But he's facing the photo. So I did the bowling pin on the left, which is his right. So, you know, it was the stage right kind of thing. So Aww. she got yeah, so the the black on it, yeah, I would have lost that week. But yeah, the black image or video plays for a few seconds, shows for a few seconds, blacks out, they ask you a question about it. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, well, this is, I'm just going to make this more of an aside to see if I can perk the ears of any Babylon 5 versus Star Trek fans. I've been on kind of a Babylon 5 kick. It's it's on Amazon Prime. Uh, I'm a big J. J. Michael Straczynski fan. He's done, He's it's amazing how many things he's been in. I didn't realize this, Brian. He wrote for the show He-Man back in the day, which may have been one of my first entrances to pop culture when I was a child. Um, did a lot of writing. He's done a lot of good stuff. So I've been on kind of a watch Babylon 5 in the background as I do work because I've seen it before. Or like listen to, you know, either podcast interviews or whatever with him. There are a lot of there's a lot of great content on the Internet where you can see video recordings of him at Comic-Con and stuff. And this is a fun nerd discussion, which is Babylon 5 versus Star Trek. Now, I'm going to tell you this just straight up. Seasons two to four of Babylon 5 kick the crap out of anything, any collection, any like run of any Star Trek series ever. That's just I'm sorry. Well, so in all fairness here, it would need to be a run of three seasons of Star Trek, right? You're saying two seasons, two, three, four, Babylon 5. So I would say for a Star Trek to compare that, it would need to be three consecutive seasons. But I'm saying even one season. I'm saying it it was kind of like a speed run, right, where – or like keep going kind of thing if we're talking like a video game. Like this person – JMS went through season four and then at season five is where, you know, he he – lost his first life or whatever, but (laughs) he was doing amazing, you know, two seasons, two through four of Babylon five are the best live action sci-fi that has probably ever been produced. I would argue, um, fight me on it. But what's interesting is if you compare Babylon five versus star Trek, first off, just the Star Trek, the number of movies they've got, the number of spinoffs they've got, right? They've got another show back in the air, right? There was this brief period of time where I think Enterprise went off the air and they, there wasn't one. But they, they've got another one. They've had all these movies go. You know, their, their conventions are much bigger. There is there is fan there is fandom among Babylon 5 fans, but even they would admit that it's nowhere near the levels of Star Trek. And what I thought about this is I basically went, 
as a run, like I just said, that single season, we call it the Bracado Prime. The Bracado Prime of Babylon 5 is amazing, but it is, it is, you know, a space captain type of show. All of the, uh, the there, there was Crusade, there's Babylon 5, season one and season five. There have been some other spinoffs uh, and other movies where essentially there were other star captains, but the only good star captain that was the lead of the show or any of the shows, so this would be Babylon 5, Crusade, or any of the movies, was Captain Sheridan, played played by Tron, Bruce Boxliner. So Captain Sheridan is the best starship captain or, you know, um, base captain, right? Because Babylon 5 is a space base. The best captain in all of the Star Trek, in all of the Babylon 5 universe, whereas in Star Trek, regardless of what you think, if you're a Picard guy, if you're a, a Kurt guy, um, Janway, right? There are so many good leads that have been captains over the years, even different actors like Chris Pine's Kirk is amazing. So I, I, I just was thinking about that today in my head and I was like, yeah, basically the one major win that Babylon 5 has is that it has this great three season run with, with uh, Tron playing well. And the thing that makes uh, Star Trek kind of just win as a whole is they have multiple great captains. And I don't know what it is because it's. I've liked some of the actors that have played the other captains. Captain Gideon is played by a Lumberg of Office Space. Um, I'm trying. I'm, I don't know why, how I'm forgetting his name, but uh, oh, his name's Lumberg, Dre. Come on, it's always going to be Lumberg. No, uh, he's been in everything. You know, he's he's uh, great. It's important uh, to point out, though, his name is Bill Lumberg, not to be confused with Ron Lumberg. So what Lumberg. happens in the movie? But Gary Cole is an amazing actor. Gary Cole, act. yes. He just wasn't good for the part. And then even uh, Captain Lockley, I didn't think she was good for the part. So it's just, it's a funny one where, for whatever reason, JMS, when he has picked captains that aren't John Sheridan, uh, just has not worked out. So it is what it is. And I, uh, I have no comments on Star Trek or Babylon 5. Sorry, Dre. Say I'm winter. Out of my element. <laughs> Winter is coming, so uh, game, game, we'll be talking Game of Thrones in a couple yeah, of weeks. Yeah, it's coming. It's back in two weeks. That's all I have to say about it. Love it. All right, so uh, the March Madness, I'm just going to – man, we're really not going to have a lot of time for WWE and wrestling. Okay, so March Madness, Coach K has just said the system needs to change, basically admitting players need to get paid. What I kind of relate this to to get political is – and who knows when it's ever going to actually happen, Brian – is when you actually notice some people in the in the Republican Party going, oh my God, we've gone too far. Can we can we stop? Like I get what we were about. I get that we were about racism and taking public money for ourselves. But but with Trump, we've gone too far. Hopefully, right? And so you've got some Republicans that are like, oh my God, come on, can we just can we just go back a little? Like we can still do it, just not that over the top. And I think Coach K is in the same boat with the NCA, where he's like, I'm a multi million dollar coach yeah. with a great gig. We can still make – we are a multi-billion dollar organization. Now that I'm set for life, let's pay these players, right, Dre? <laughs> now that I'm set for life, I think he's going, look it. We're part of a multi-billion dollar organization that has the backing of a bigger multi-billion dollar organization, the NBA, that is already really good at winning labor disputes. So we don't need to crush our opponent. We don't need to crush the players and pay them nothing or get mad at them if they give food to their friends or let a friend sleep on their hotel room when they go to the game. We can give them money. We can pay them. We can let them have – we can let them sell jerseys if they want with their name on the back that they'll probably for most of these players make little to no money on. That is not a big deal. But if we keep on this route – you know, I, as I even mentioned to you, right, I think like Luka Doncic is kind of a possible turning point. And we've even seen NBA teams going for the G League and Mark Cuban for years has been basically saying this about the D League going or G League now. We might be wasting our players time in college. They, they cannot be getting the same level of training in college as they would be getting as a professional athlete for a professional squad. And these are high valued assets. And then again, even with Zion Williamson. He almost injured himself. If Zion gets injured, he's no good to any team. That that happened, don't forget, with like Greg, Greg Oden and Sam Bowie. So it's like I think the NBA is slowly starting to go. The value of these players has exceeded the marginal benefit we're getting from from um, from wage suppression that your system is providing. And if you don't fix it, we're going to have to go behind your back. And so it is an amusing one where I think even Coach K is recognizing it going like this staunchness of the student athlete. Come on, like. Can we can we at least move on from that? Can we can we all agree that's stupid? Like if we give them all a hundred thousand dollars and you know ten thousand dollars for every round they win in the tournament, it'll probably make most of them happy and we're fine. Yeah, and to go back to Gladwell, who you mentioned earlier in the show, 
That Zion Williamson moment, we said at the time, everyone said it. That was such a big tipping point, Dre, I think, for this. All these different parts of NCAA corruption just coalesced into this one moment. Obama himself was sitting there and pointed at the camera and said his shoe broke. Like All this stuff happened. Adam Silver came out right away after that and said, we're going to start letting you know younger high school players go directly to the developmental league. So... Yeah, everyone knew it needed to happen, and this tipping point of Zion happened, and now I think it's just going forward. Yeah, and I mean, the the real question will be if it's, you know, like the tobacco lobby or whatever, although the tobacco lobby eventually did right. They hopped off the tobacco ship and moved into food, so is what it is. But yeah, it's kind of the how long are people going to stay on the ship that is very obviously sinking? And the frustrating part, I'll say as a fan, because you just heard me bring up like the Republican Party is, when you've got a big ship with a lot of money and influence and power on it, it can take an awfully long time to sink. So even if you go there as a giant hole in that boat, might be a while. Yeah. Speaking of a giant ship with a big hole in it with lots of problems, uh, John Oliver did. It's kind of interesting, Brian. I would call this a very tame covering of WWE. Very so, even-handed and fair, I would say. Well, I'm. I would even say if you're a Mark, so Mark is someone who knows the ins and outs of of professional wrestling. A lot of what he brought up is old hat, and in fact, a lot of the pe- a lot of the clips he used, a lot of the people he used, he used, you know, Roddy Piper, Jake the Snake Roberts from the 80s. He used Mick Foley, who I brought up, you know, from the 90s. And his point was, if we're talking about a multi-billion dollar organization that just exploits its labor, it's professional wrestling. And the 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 the, the one crystallizing moment for me of the of the documentary or the segment, right? It's just it's it's last night tonight last week tonight. What's it called? Yeah. So he does a long segment on that show about a topic, and this was twenty three minutes long on the WWE. It's a minute segment about the WWE that you can find. It's on YouTube. It's uh, like I said, I think it's last week tonight with John Oliver, mm-hmm. and and I obviously I don't watch it live. I just wait until good segments that interest me come up, and then I watch it. And you know, unless it's the DFS one, I'm like, ah, oh, good job. Okay. But uh, so he said in this in this segment, the WWE makes the NFL look good because the NFL recently offered health care to all of their players. Right. So they basically said, hey, if you played for us, you get health care. Nice bare minimum moment. You know, I, I've made this kind of joke and comment before where I get frustrated when when someone does what they're supposed to do. They don't get an award when when a player that's a shooting guard shoots average in the NBA. I'm not like, good job. You're a star. I'm like, you've shot average. Shoot above average and we can talk. You're not a star yet. So but that that crystallizing moment where he said the WWE makes the NFL look good. And what's also amusing about this, there was so much he left out, which I understand. Right. It's 23, 23 minute segment. And he kept it. I, I thought a very smart thing is he kept it very focused. He kept it very focused on the WWE overworks their employees mistreats their employees with how they're classified. They're classified as independent contractors. And he actually goes over the legal definitions for what it would take to be an independent contractor and says, if you're an independent contractor, then essentially they can't have like non-competes with you and they shouldn't be, basically you can't be a huge part of the business that you are being an independent contractor for. So it's kind of saying this works really well in entertainment. If you are the face of the franchise, you shouldn't be an independent contractor, but that's exactly what happened. CM Punk's interview, which is referenced a few times in this, he is a famous wrestler that left the WWE and did a series of long podcasts where he just said all the problems he had with it, noted that he was fired by the WWE, but he was an independent contractor, which meant technically he wasn't, you know, they, he wasn't an employee. They shouldn't have had that right. They had non-compete clauses about him going to do um, mixed martial arts, uh, which, you know, he did have to adhere to and given his age might have cost him at least one competitive fight because he did not do good in mixed martial arts. So all of this messed up stuff about how they abuse their labor and how a lot of this stuff isn't legal. And at least all I'll say about it that I really liked is that it, it's a nice push to say you really need to treat your employees better and you would hope in a fair world that either someone with a billion dollars would go, hey, I have a billion dollars, maybe I could treat the people that helped me make it better. Or you'd have regulations in place. I'm not anti-regulation, so if, if you're on, on that train, whatever. Regulations in place that say, hey, you, you can't mistreat your wrestlers, so but that's not where we're at. So hopefully, I think this, I'd be interested to see what the long-term benefit of this is. And then what I also mentioned is a new wrestling promotion run by the owner of the um, Jacksonville Jaguars is coming up. And I said this would be an amazing moment if they wanted to come out and say, we're going to call our wrestlers employees and we're going to offer them health care. I, I think that would be 
an amazingly suave move because the other alternative, by the way, Brian, this is funny and sad, is Vince McMahon, the owner and villain of this piece in the WWE, is trying to start his own football league. So John Oliver just said the only organization in North American sports that's worse than the NFL is the WWE, and WWE is trying to get into the football game. And didn't he already start a football league? Wasn't he involved in the XFL, or was that someone else? I can't remember. But he started up the XFL, and it lasted one season and was, yeah. was horrible. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the thing I'll say about this is, um, yeah, there was no, no new ground cover, but it was a very good summary. Like, I love seeing stuff like this where all the facts that we know are presented in a coherent way. So, yeah, I recommend watching this. Well, I mean, I, yeah, it also gets funny as like stat nerds, and I've, I've said this to like Dave and Arturo and you before, where it's like there are times where there's a story we've said many times. And I'm like, you know, our following's not that big. We can say the same story again. Like, and that's the same thing with John Oliver. There are thousands and thousands of wrestling fans, maybe millions and millions, that know these stories, but there are millions and millions of people who are unaware about wrestling that, you know, this is going to be the first time they've seen it. So, I'd be interesting to see what happened. The, the the fallout, so to speak, is WWE saying to John Oliver, "You should come to Vince. You should come to WrestleMania next week to get the real story." And I have no idea what that take was, um, because even in the segment, it was very obvious John Oliver. I mean, true or not, right? Said he was a wrestling fan. So either either he's a wrestling fan or his crack team of writers is a wrestling fan. He showed lots of clips. He made lots of comments. He had amazing uh, an amazing number of clips that he showed. A lot of Mick Foley. Who you know, as as we've said before, is one of our favorite wrestlers, and it just pains me knowing that I can't believe he's going to be there long term. And that was one of the graphs. Is just if we if you look at the lifespan expectancy of professional wrestlers, it is horrendous. And even one of the saddest clips I'd never seen this clip before, but Roddy Piper came up and said, "I don't have a pension that I can collect before 65. I have no discernible skills that can pay me really well." So I'm just going to keep wrestling, and I'm not going to make it to 65, and and that is what happened. So yeah, he said it at age 49. I want to say was that interview, and he died at age 61. Yeah. So a depressing thing if you're a wrestling fan. I mean, it's it's a funny one where sports in general has a lot of. We've talked the dark underbelly of things that we enjoy, and uh, wrestling is definitely one of them. Yeah. Okay. Dr- just real fast, Dre. Um, Dick Dale just died. Uh, famous rock and roll, you know, musician, famous for playing surf rock. And um, he was 81, something like that. And um, he tried to retire, but he couldn't afford his medical bills. So he had to start touring again. He's had such bad health that, you know, he could barely stand up on stage and all that. But he's like, well, I got to pay my medical bills. So he went up there and he just toured until he died, basically. So, yeah. There is a a wrestler, and I don't know the state of him. It can't be that good. But uh, Scott Hall, there is a good ESPN 30 for 30 short on him. That's exactly that, where there are times he gets into the ring, either be on prescription or not prescription. And that's that's another weird thing about the WWE is that, and and sports in general, right? This this weird legal marijuana case we've got going on in the United States that I in in 20 years, Brian, I've got to believe is going to be so baffling, where we we had this opioid crisis where. For our professional athletes, we said, you are injuring your bodies. You are allowed to take as many opioids as you want while simultaneously saying, if you take weed, we will suspend you from the league that makes money for you. Yeah. But yeah, like, so, Who's making money off it? That's the real you yeah. know, answer. But Scott Hall, either via legal or illegal substances, would end up in the ring. They'd have to you know, walk him out because he's super old and beat up. And it's just like he needs a payday and they're like, well, we paid you, you know, and not that much, right? Probably a couple hundred, a couple thousand dollars. We paid you to be here. Our fans paid us to see you. So we're going to put you out there. And it was it was really depressing to see. I do not have that was a depressing, depressing show, Brian. Uh, We we, go to shout outs. (laughs) And I didn't put any shout outs on the show. So. Uh, that'll, that'll be the show. I'll let you give any shout outs, Brian, and, and we can be done. Yeah, we'll, we'll go back to talking NBA next week. That's a more fun topic that we like. God, there's so many good teams this year, and it's going to be a great playoff. So that'll be my we, positive we, way we, to end it. I will talk, have a shout out, though. Brian, you just bookended it with two depressing topics. Yeah, I'll have one shout out. Um, NorCal Regionals was this weekend, so I got to talk about that here in my backyard in San Jose, California. We have some results here. I, wa- I did watch the finals of Street Fighter, and it was incredible. It was taken down by Tokido, who has been one of the best Street Fighter 5 players and best Street Fighter players overall, for that matter. 
from Japan. He took down USA's punks. It was the classic USA versus Japan battles and grand finals. Punk reset the bracket. He came from losers and was one round away from taking the whole thing, I want to say. But then Tokido had his own comeback to win it. So that was great. Um, the final, you know, the rest of the top eight was Fudo, John Takauchi, Smug, Gachi Kun, Fujimura, and Daigo Umahara. So, wow. Hell of a Street Fighter top eight at NorCal Regionals this week, Andre. Those are all my shout outs. Well, actually, I'm going to steal the shout out you gave me pre show, Brian, because we weren't paying attention. The U.S. championship in chess happened oh, this yeah. last And uh, Hikaru Nakamura took it down. And I actually want to get the uh, woman's title, too, because I believe I saw that on chess.com earlier. Neither of us was really paying attention. It's just uh, yeah. just one of the things. But um, come on, where is the results? Go to chess.com just to see this really funny picture of Hikaru. So, who, yeah, I just want to make sure we give a shout out to both the men and the women. So, Hikaru Nakamura. Uh, won it, uh, and as we mentioned, our boy Fabiano Corona tied for second. So, Fabiano, what are you no, doing? My boy is Sam Shanklin, Dre from Berkeley. He finished sixth after winning last year, so shout out to him as well. But, but to your point, um, chess. I'm gonna look. I refuse to, to end the show until we get. Yeah, this we'll pro- we'll find this. Are you are you googling as well? We can have. No, a race. I'm just on Chess.com browsing around here, so. I'm just going to scroll down until I find because it happened the week before, right? The men's happened about a week ago. The women's was like two weeks ago, okay. something like that. But Jennifer, you there was 17 there years. Holy cow. Not wow. bad. And then I, I know you mentioned one. It's like, so they're really yeah, young. Wesley. So, um, yeah, he finished top eight as well for the men. So, I mean, that's at least in terms of us chess, that is an amazing spot to be, to have some, really young really talented players that that just won the title so well right. yeah 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 or as you mentioned played well top 10 fine we'll give them top 10 okay <laughs> anyway that's been the show if you've been us not through the website you can find us at boxscoregeeks.com i've been your host Ray alvarez aka nerd numbers with me as always brian foster you can find most places as box score brian we go live every week usually around 9 30 p.m eastern standard time on twitch.tv forward slash nerd numbers, and you can catch the recap of those shows on channel nerd numbers on YouTube. We also have an iTunes and Stitcher show, the Box Score Geek Show. Subscribe, upvote, all that stuff helps us out. Anyway, hope your team's in the playoffs. If they're not, they're Charlotte. <laughs>